All right, welcome to statistics. We're gonna look at significance this go around. We're gonna look at kind of the overview and then I'll be making another video that we can use to kind of dig in on some of the other details along with it. So it'll be a part one, part two is probably, there may be a part three for this one even, but I'm hoping to get them both in on two. All right, so to dig, jump right in there, the first thing that we need to understand about significance when we talk about statistics is this idea that uh, the data that we collect is actually useful and also then we can compare it to other uh, data collections and see does it match up so this idea here's an example for us you know talking about basketball playing so let's just say that you and a friend are talking about being uh, playing basketball and your friend claims to be a phenomenally good basketball player uh, 75 percent three throw uh, shooter from the uh, from the three throw line uh, if you look at you know like NBA uh, players that's that's even pretty high amongst a lot of them but let's just say that's what they're claiming to be. And then you and that person go out to the court and uh, they take 20 shots and they make only eight of them. And the question then becomes, is that enough for you to say that they were lying about their 75% three throw percentage? Um, or is, is, it, is that within the realm of possibility uh, of, you know, like there, there might be a, a time or statistically speaking that, that it might be acceptable that you might have as low as eight on that shooting range, right, uh, and, and on 20 shots. So then we sit down, we look at, well, we can identify this as being a binomial distribution on this one because we have 75% make, 25% miss. So that's two outcomes. Yes or no, false, true, false, however you want to align that, but that is a binomial distribution where P and Q are 0.75 and 0.25 respectively. And using the probability for uh, binomials, which means that we take the combinations uh, for a particular event times the probability of, uh, of uh, success times the probability of failure and then we add that to all the other probabilities for because in this instance I'm looking at the possibility that the uh, your friend got eight or fewer shots so we're doing eight we're doing seven we're doing six we're doing five we're doing four three two and all the way down to zero we're looking at the possible the probability of all those combined scenarios which means on that first one we'd be doing 20 choose eight uh, times 0.75 to the eighth power times uh, 0.25 to the 12th power. So that is the probability of success times the probability of failure and uh, times the number of combinations, the number of ways that that could happen, uh, the number of um, unique ways that can happen. Uh, so we, we figure out that those combinations with that. All right. So, and, and the reason why we do combinations is because uh, shot number one is shot number one, so there's not an instance where the permutation aspect of this is really needs to be considered. So anyway, we do that and we find that the probability for this is 0 .0009. Now you can pause this, you can go back and look up how to do po uh, the binomials. I encourage you to do that process just to make sure you understand where that, that value comes from. And uh, I, I've worked it out several times myself, different ways to make sure that that is the correct value. But that's the probability of getting eight or fewer shots, which means we're talking about nine ten thousandths or nine out of ten thousand uh, uh, scenarios where that occurs. Is this enough evidence for us to say, well, this just isn't likely? Uh, you're not going to be a 75 percent th uh, free throw free throw shooter and make eight out of 20. It's just that's too low of a probability. Uh, you're going to make more than eight shots. That's the that's what statistically that's what this means. So what we can say is there's strong evidence to reject the person being a 75% shooting, uh, having a shooting average, right? So that claim is false. Now, another scenario is just say like uh, talking about drinking sodas and the idea that uh, we can, they're too sweet, they're not sweet enough, okay? So they did some data collection. We found that the mean was zero. The, the particular soda line was uh, uh, whatever the answer, whatever the question was, is this too sweet? The answer is yes. The other version of this might be no or whatever. And the standard deviation for the population was one. And the, the, uh, the mu value or the mean for the population was zero. So we're, we're talking about this being a standard normal, normal set, right? So we, we go through this process and we figure out that the set, we're, we've collected data from 10 individuals, which is our standard deviation for that sample to be 0.316 and of that population we find that the average is 0.3 
Well, 0.3 for an average for that mean was within one standard deviation of the actual assumed average. So this is not strong evidence to reject that that could actually be the case. All right, so we're looking for something that's outside the bounds of what we would expect to just discover. So what does this mean? When we talk about strong evidence, what we're really getting after, and we want to call, quantify this in some way, we can't just say, okay, we we'll arbitrarily pick these things. We can look inside the standard deviations. We can look inside the means to, for these, these values and these answers. So we can look at two-sided and one-sided, what called hypothesis testing. And two-sided simply means that we have uh, the null hypothesis, which is H sub zero, or H sub O, or however, lots of different ways that can be written, but that's the null, that's the first bullet point there under two-sided, and the mu value being zero, or some other quantity, all right? So that'd be the sample, that's what, it, not for the sample, I'm sorry, for the population. So this would that average for the, for the population that we're looking at, as opposed to the individual group, right? And the alternate, in this case, for the two-sided would mean that mu is not zero, okay, or whatever that value is that we're assuming the average to be. So the idea being here is that we're going to assume the null hypothesis is true until we can prove it otherwise. So the idea being here is that we're going to assume the mean is this value for the population. We're going to test to see if the um, mean for the sample fits. And that's what this is talking about with two-sided. In this particular case with a two-sided, we're meaning is it greater than, is it less than? And then we can also look at a one-sided, which simply means is it less than? Now notice we don't have less than or equal to. This is strictly less than because we're saying mu is greater than zero or, or mu is less than zero would be the way we'd write that and mu being equal to zero. Uh, so those are the two ways that we can do that, one-sided and a two-sided. Okay. And this leads us to the real big one of the p-value. So statistical statistic, statistic, the test statistic is calculated from the data. So we need the data set, the sample, in order to do this. That p-value is the probability that the null is true. Another more precise way to look at this is that the smaller the value to, for p is, the stronger the evidence against h, uh, the, our null hypothesis. Meaning, if we want to know, uh, another way to look at this, if, if, if you spend a little time just kind of digging in on this, what this means is that we're finding the probability that that other situation is true. So if you come back with a p-value of 0 0.01, that's the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true. So this, that's the probability that uh, mu is less than, you know, like in the basketball case, that'd be the probability that mu is less than 8. Um, you're talking about the soda case, that'd be the probability that mu is less than zero, okay? Um, that's what we're talking about is that the, what is the probability of this other way of thinking instead of it being exactly zero, um, that it is less than zero. That's, and then if we have a really small value of p, then we get to reject the null hypothesis, which was assumed to be true, and we accept the alternate hypothesis as a result. So it's kind of, spend some time digging in on that because it, it, it seems kind of, weird and backwards possibly to some people. Now, let's think about an example here. So let's, if we have an average income of 50 or 35,000 and some change, and we, we base that on a national average, so that's our mu, that's our assumed to be true value. And then local, we, we, we interview or we collect data from 62 individuals. And this data is actually for women um, with a high school diploma, but nothing further. Uh, and we find that locally that the average uh, salary for these 62 women who have a high school diploma and nothing more is 35053 versus the national average of fit at 35713. And the question then becomes, is this significantly off of the actual average that we would expect? Is, this, is it outside the realms? Meaning, does this population actually have a distinct difference between the national average, which actually can give us a lot of information. So the question first, though, is what's the null? The null would be assuming that mu is the actual value there, the 35,713. All right. The alternate is that it's less than 35,713. Why, why, why less than? Because locally, the local value is less. So we're saying, is it makes sense if the local value is smaller? So if we come up with a p-value that is, let's just say, 0.5, well, that'd be 50% probability that the hypotenuse or that the null hypothesis is true. So we would fail to reject that null hypothesis because we don't have enough evidence to push back on it. 
But if we were to come back and say it was 0 0.05 was the probability that the null hypothesis is true, then we would reject the null hypothesis and we'd keep the, um, uh, the alternate. Okay, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So here, let's just say that P is equal to 1.123. We fail to reject the null, right? We fail to reject the null, which means that we assumed the, uh, that 3517 was the case, and we're continuing to assume that that is the case. We're not rejecting it. But if we were to make it the p-value 0.023, that's the probability, right? That's the probability that um, that value is wrong, which means we would reject the null and we'd keep the alternative. That may seem a little weird, but what we're saying here is that we actually, what we're, we have a 90, uh, roughly a 98% probability that the alternate is true. That's what that's saying, okay? And that's fairly high. And, and 0.5 is actually our standard for this. So this is our value, our statistical significant uh, value, um, level or standard level of significance. And 0 0.05 is the standard value we use for that. So statistically significant level of accuracy is 0 0.05, or the idea that 95% of the data actually disagrees with what our null is, okay? Which means we reject the null and in favor of the alternative, okay? And there you go. And more to come on this topic. That's a lot of data, a lot of things to, to kind of digest. So spend some time, rewatch this if you need to, find additional videos. And always do more statistics, right? And data really adds up on that stuff. Take care.